Are we ready to go to the Word of God today? All right, good. Glad you're with me today. Uh, take out your Bibles. Uh, we're going to be uh, starting in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, so you can turn there. Friends, the Christian life is a battle. Battles are a part of life. We all face them. Some of our battles are, are more difficult than others. Some, some only last a day, maybe even a couple hours, and we get through it. Some battles last years and years. Whether they are physical or emotional or spiritual, every person faces battles that we must overcome. I, I, I also was a little emotional driving here today looking at the sun, and, and I actually I got a little, a little emotional thinking, Lord, we made it through. We made it through the last year. And I was so grateful to the Lord for that. We all face battles of varying kinds. And, and I've been following Jesus. I love how Philip started the service. We didn't plan that. But I love how he started the service because I've been thinking, I've been following Jesus for decades. And, and yet along the journey, there's been, there's been a wonderful times, blessed times, high points in my walk. And there have been battle after battle after battle. Matter of fact, uh, last night during New Year, New Wine, I was... For a moment, I was laying on my face over here during the worship, and, and the Lord reminded me. I love it when he whispers things to us. And he reminded me when I was over here last night, the Lord whispered to me, and he said, Bill, it was 10 years ago today you started your three-month sabbatical. And I was blown away that, yep, indeed it was January 2nd, 2011. I left you all for three months, 12 weeks, to go get with the Lord and go get refreshed. And the Lord was reminding me and like, boom, that's how fast life goes. 10 years, just like that. But the Lord is doing great things. We all face battles. We all face various periods of, of times of not facing battles and times of intense things in our life. I have faced battles just as you have. I, I've faced times of, of intense temptation or, or doubt or fear, even anxiety. Uh, there have been times of even deep sadness in my, in my spirit, in my heart. There have been great loss. There have been battles over, over health and, and, and over lack of sleep and over finances and over work and even relationships. There's all kinds of battles that I face. I'm sure you face them too. There are periods that I've experienced of great oppression and even great criticism. But Ephesians chapter 6, let's go there. Let's begin this series, The Battle Belongs to the Lord, by looking at this familiar passage that Paul writes to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 18. There's been a lot of instruction up to this point, and then Paul says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all, stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and, and the shoes of peace. Having put on the, the oh, I ha, and, and as for shoes, your feet, having put on the readiness by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, say in all circumstances, Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. And to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And then in 2 Timothy 4, verse 7, uh, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, he writes these words at the end of his life, the end of Paul's life. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. 
Notice Paul didn't say, I danced a good dance. I like to dance. Well, try to. I got two left feet, but I still try to. He didn't say like everything's happy-go-lucky in life. No, Paul says his, his life with the gospel was a fight. And he finished his race because he fought the good fight of faith. Keep the faith. Keep the faith. So place your hands on your Bibles as we start this message and this series. And let's commit it to the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. And we ask today that you'll light your word alive in our hearts. Our God, and when we leave here today, wow, let us, let us declare surely the presence of the Lord was in our midst. In Jesus' name, the strong Son of God, we pray. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. I've shared this before, but it's the perfect setup for this series. In the summer of 2019, so a year and a half ago, actually I looked in my journal and it was August 26, 2019. After having a time sitting with my therapist in his office and, and talking about life and ministry. And we had a moment where we began to go to some places where I've had some disappointments. Where I've had some things where my expectations were one thing and things didn't pan out the way I had thought they would. And so in that moment, in that moment sitting in that therapy office, my therapist said, well, Bill, why don't we ask the Lord what his expectation is of you as a pastor. Let, let's ask the Lord, what is his expectation for your role at Lighthouse Church? I said, yeah, I'd like to do that. Matter of fact, so many times when the therapist speaks, I think, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> and so sitting there on the couch with my hands like this, we just prayed, we just asked the, the Lord. It was a simple prayer, but a heartfelt prayer. Lord, what's your desire? What's your desire for my role as a pastor? And we just sat there in the stillness. I don't know for how long. Just waited. And then my therapist said to me, he said, Bill, do you sense anything? I said, yeah, yeah, I do. He says, do you want to share what he's saying to you? And I said, yeah. I feel the Lord just said, love the people. Love the people. I want you to show the people my love. And I sat there almost amazed. You know like when the Lord speaks, it's so simple but so profound? It was one of those moments. And I'm like, yeah. All the hustle, all the running, all the doing that I do, you've seen it. And the Lord is whispering to my spirit saying, Bill, all I'm asking of you is to love the people. So my therapist then said, well, guiding me along this conversation with the Lord. He says, why don't you ask the Lord what your expectation has been? I said, okay. So we sit there and I say, Lord, what, what has been my expectation? Maybe some of the cause of some of the, the disappointment in my heart. And as I sat and waited... The Lord just whispered to my spirit, Bill, you've put the expectation on yourself to grow this to be a big church or to grow this to be a church with multiple sites. You've looked at too many other models and too many other things. Hope that's the Lord calling. And hear the Lord saying, that's not my expectation on you. That's the expectation you put on you. His expectation and desire is that I just love you, the people of God. Well, it went on from there. I repented. I repented of comparison. I repented of having false expectation that was put on myself by myself, not put on me by the Lord. And then my therapist said, Bill, as you've repented and given that over to the Lord, maybe, maybe the Lord wants to give you something in replace because that's how God is. When we let go of something, he usually gives us something in return. Not that we ask for it, but that's just how generous he is. 
And so I sat there and I said, Lord, Lord, is there anything? Is there anything you want to give me? And as I sat there with my eyes closed, not in the physical, but in the spiritual sense, this is what I saw. I saw the Lord in the Spirit place a sword in my hands. And I sat there, my hands literally began to shake like this. And my therapist knew something's going on here. And he just waited. And I literally started to almost tremble. Again, there wasn't a physical sword, but this is what I saw in the Spirit. And I sat there. And he said, Bill, what's going on? I said, the Lord just put a sword in my hand. And he said, let's ask the Lord what the sword means. And I said, Lord, what does this sword mean? And the Lord spoke to me again. And he said, I want you to teach my people how to fight their battles in the spirit realm. I'm giving you a sword as a piece of equipment that you will teach my people how to fight their battles in the spirit realm. So I've been sitting on this. I've been meditating with the Lord. I plan to share some of these things last spring. Then COVID hit. And the Lord said, no, it's time for you to wait so that I can teach, so he could teach me some more things that I could then share with you. Along that journey, over these several months, the Lord gave me a cross stick for sword. By the way, before we get to that, this is a replica sword of King Solomon's sword. And... Um, Oh, it's, it's beautiful, it's heavy, it's weighty. Oh, I just cut my... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. So the Lord's given me an acrostic for the word sword. And this is how we learn to fight battles. This is the series that we're starting today, over the next several weeks, many weeks. And the Lord says that the S in sword is spirit. If we're going to fight our battles and let the Lord fight our battles, we have to move in the spirit. George, your word today was perfect. Because like you said, so many of us have been stiff in church and we didn't, we didn't learn how to flow in the Holy Spirit. But if we're going to fight our battles with the Lord, give our battles to the Lord, we have to know how to move in the spirit. We're going to talk about that. The W in sword is word, the word of God. We even just read it in Ephesians 6. The word of God is a sword. It's the only offensive weapon. And I'm going to get to that in an upcoming series. I mean, upcoming message in the series. The O in sword is obedience. We can hear from the Spirit. We can learn and know the word of God, but if we are not obedient to how the Spirit speaks and what the word of God says, we will suffer needlessly and not experience the victory because we have not been obedient. We're going to talk about that in this series. The R in sword the Lord gave me is relationships. We've, we've discovered, haven't we, this year, how much we need relationships. I shared with my wife and others, I am depleted of sitting across someone at a coffee shop or at or, or a lunch. I'm, not, I'm, I'm okay on this part from the lunch, but, <laughs> but, but, but from the relational part of lunch. Just being with you, the people of God. Sharing in, in, in relationships and fellowship. The Bible calls it koinonia. Koinonia fellowship. 
And that's why I'm going to pause right here on this word sword. And, and, and I want to take a moment and let Philip invite you to the hub. So we're going to play another video before we get to D. Go ahead when you're ready. What's the hub? Hey church, I want to invite you to the Lighthouse Hub with me this Tuesday at 7 p.m. And you may be asking yourself, what is the Hub? Let me tell you, the Hub is going to be an event like none other. On Tuesdays at 7 p.m., it is going to be an online event. Not in person, but for you to enjoy it live in your homes, on the go, wherever you find yourselves. Our hope is that you can connect, share, and grow over the Sunday morning message. We believe that the Sunday morning message deserves conversation throughout the week. And with the brand new series that we're starting, The Battle Belongs to the Lord, we want to create some conversations as a body so that we can better fight our battles in the supernatural realm this year. So I want you to go to our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, subscribe, like if you're not, and join us at The Hub this Tuesday at 7 p.m. need relationships. And I think Philip is the perfect person to host and get, gather some co-hosts each week and um, to talk about the message, to talk about some aspects of what the Lord was speaking to you as we went to the Word of God. So if you're available, we want this to be organic. We don't want to get you in a group per se. We just want you to organically reach out to somebody. And by the way, they don't even need to go to Lighthouse. They can be a neighbor, a friend, a coworker, and say, hey, I'm doing this thing called The Hub. There's going to be clips of the, uh, of the sermon that will be played. So even if they didn't see the message, they'll still follow along because there'll be clips that will be played, and then there'll be discussion, and then, the, then we'll turn it over to you to have your discussion. Again, you can do it on Tuesday nights. Uh, maybe you gather with some few people at your home, or maybe you give them a phone call and you talk over the phone. Or maybe for you it's Zoom, and you're like, you know, I don't live by the people, but we're going to just or get, I'm gonna reach out, and we're going to hop on Zoom, and we're going to talk about it that way. So however it works for you, uh, we invite you to that aspect of growing in relationship. The final letter in sword the Lord has given me is discipleship. Discipleship. Spirit, word, obedience, relationships, discipleship. It's becoming more like Jesus. These are things we're going to talk about in the coming weeks as way of introduction to this series. Now let me give you the message for today. The message for today, I want to share with you that there is a secret to making your battles belong to the Lord. Do you want to know what it is? There is a secret in the Word of God for how we make our battles belong to the Lord. You see, many of us have not been taught how to take the battle we're facing and not only invite the Lord into that battle, but to release that battle into the Lord. Because when we fight our battles, when we try to navigate our trials of life, maybe in relationships or maybe lack of finance or whatever it might be, we end up holding on to our own battle. And although we say the battle belongs to the Lord, the reality for many of us is the battle's really not the Lord's because the battle is still ours. And so today I want to give you the secret to how, as we start this series, how we can make sure that our battles that we face, maybe you're facing right now or that you will face in the future, that those battles can be the Lord's and not yours. So we're going to look at, um, we're, we're going to look at, uh, I'm going to skip some stuff, guys, on the notes. So I'm going to jump down to the secret part of the battle. And we're going to look at um, a passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. So if you want to turn there with me, I, this, is, this is going to be a passage, most likely you're going to hear this passage again in this series, but you're going to look at it differently than we're going to look at it today. So 2 Chronicles 20, uh, the first 15 verses, and this is about a guy who's a king, Jehoshaphat, and um, so let's just read it here, Second Chronicles 20, and then we'll glean some things uh, from this passage. Second Chronicles 20, starting at verse 1. After this, the Moabites, the Ammonites, with some of the Menunites, a lot of ites here, uh, they came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Say battle. 
And some of, the, some of the men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea. And behold, they are on uh, Hezeron Tamar, that is, and Gedi. I have to pause right here, because when there's a moment in Scripture that I can share a picture with you, I want to share it with you. So you know that some of us went to Israel a few years ago. Here is what En Gedi looks like. That's the, that's the Dead Sea or the Salt Sea down at the bottom. It's super hot, super dry. This is the location where this passage we're looking at took place. Now, just for fun, there's my wife and I. Here's another one. And as we hiked, stop right there. Don't move any farther. As we hiked through the dryness up this mountain in En Gedi, we didn't even know quite what was going on. We did stop for a little discussion, a little sharing by our guide. And they shared with us that this also is the same location where, where, uh, where David and Saul had an encounter up in a cave where, 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 where God spoke to, to, to David, do not uh, uh, touch God's anointed. And, and, and this was the scene of also this story we're reading here uh, about King Jehoshaphat. And as we are walking up in this very dry spot, all of a sudden, we come to this waterfall. And it was like, where is this water coming from? It's like came out of nowhere. It was so hot. It was so dry. And we turn a corner, and there is this beautiful waterfall. And as we were at this waterfall, we began to take off our hiking shoes, and we began to wade in the water. And then while we were wading in the water, our Bible guide opened, his, opened scriptures, and he turned to uh, Psalm 42, and he said, this is where, where David, the psalmist, wrote, as a deer pants for water, so my soul longs for the living God. That was the moment. That was the place. Well, we love that moment in Engedi. I gotta show you one more picture. One more picture. Go ahead. Here's Doug. That, that is Doug right here. Doug's over here. Wave, wave your hand, Doug. That's Doug saying, I want all of you, Lord. Just pour out over us. What a moment. What a moment. See, that's why I had to stop there. Okay, let's keep reading the story. This is in Gedi. Verse 3. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid, and he set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. All of the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem and the house of the Lord before the new court. And he said, okay, here begins to pray. Here's his prayer of King Jehoshaphat, in the midst of these armies coming to attack. And he prays, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over the kingdoms and the nations. In your hand are power and might, and so none is able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? Abraham was a friend of God. And then they lived in it, and they have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we'll, uh, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry out to you uh, uh, in our affliction, and you will hear and save. And now behold, the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt and whom they avoided and did not destroy. Behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. Verse 12, we're gonna come back to this. Let's hone in on verse 12. If you can underline or highlight, highlight, highlight verse 12. Oh, our God, Will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Not a long prayer. Not a long prayer, but friends, I want you to know today, your prayers do not have to be long to be effective. So verse 13, Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with, with their little ones and their wives and their children. And the Spirit of the Lord, say the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord came on Jehazel. And it goes through all these descendants of who he's the son of. Basically, Jehazel, a Levite, the son of Asaph, in the middle of the assembly. And he said, listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you. Do you think they leaned in? 
The battle's coming. The, the warrior, the armies are coming. And they just cried out to the Lord. They fasted and prayed. And now the word of the Lord comes. Do not be afraid. And do not be dismayed at this great horde. For the battle is not yours. Here's the line. The battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. And we're going to look more at that probably in a few weeks. But of what happened. Basically, they do win the battle. I'll just tell you quick. They sent the worshipers out in front. Not even the warriors. They sent the worshipers. And God caused confusion. And all of the armies turned on themselves because the battle was the Lord's. And they got the victory. How many say, oh yeah, I'll take two of these? Yeah. Jehoshaphat. This, this, this king at the time. There's a downside to Jehoshaphat. There's a downside to him. He, he had what maybe you would call, a, 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 he, had a sense, he had a false sense of friendliness. He, he befriended people. He didn't have discernment. And he befriended the, the, the king of the, of, of the northern kingdom, Ahab. And Ahab's wife was named Jezebel. They were Baal worshipers. They were idolaters. They were wicked. And yet Jehoshaphat befriended Ahab. And there's some things here where, where Jehoshaphat, you need this backstory. He, he, he didn't have always the best sense of, 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 of wisdom and discernment here. And so he even gives, Jehoshaphat gives his son to marry Ahab and Jezebel's daughter. And she was just as wicked as her parents. But yet Jezebel, uh, 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 excuse me, Jehoshaphat gives his son to marry their daughter. Sometimes he didn't know how to say no. He ran with bad people. Another time, Scripture tells us that, that Jehoshaphat was with Ahab, and Ahab was going to go into a battle. So it's just two kings, they're going to go into a battle. And, and, and this was none of Jehoshaphat's business. Like, get out of there. This is not your battle. But Ahab says to him, hey, you're a king. You wear the king's robe, garments. And Ahab says, I'm going to put on armor, and I'm going to go with the warriors. Why, why would Ahab do that? Why would Jehoshaphat agree to that? He did it because the warriors know. Find the king. It's kind of like playing chess. Get the king. And Jehoshaphat was like, oh, yeah, okay. I'll wear the king's deal. Even though you're the king of this territory, you can go and disguise yourself in with one of the warriors. I mean, he didn't always have the best sense about him. But yet sometimes, well, basically, uh, when, when, but when a battle came, Jehoshaphat was one who cried out to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord. And, and, and um, sometimes, friends, when we can be strong when there's an emergency. But maybe sometimes we are unwise and weak in everyday life decisions. That summarizes King Jehoshaphat. Okay, you need that as a backside, backstory. Let's move on to these four ingredients quickly today for the secret of your battle. We're going to end with a testimony that you're not going to want to miss today. Okay, so four ingredients we see from this text. First of all, before we can be successful in, 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 in winning our battles, we must first go vertical. We must do what Jehoshaphat did. When we see a battle coming, we see it's before us. We see we got the, we got the phone call. We got the text. We heard the news at work. We, 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 we found out from a, from a family member. Something's up. What do we do? We pray. The first thing we do is pray. Everything starts with humility. We must go low. We must pray. Maybe you got anger that rises up in you. Maybe there's selfishness. Maybe, maybe it's a situation in a relationship. What do you do first? You pray. You pray. You go vertical. You go before the Lord and you say, Lord, I got this situation. By the way, he already knows you have a situation. He's just waiting for you to acknowledge him in the midst of your situation. And so you come before the Lord and you say, as Jehoshaphat did, you say, I need God. God, I need you. Jesus, help. That's the most effective prayer. Jesus, help. Right? I need God. Go ahead. Just, just in humility, just say it right now. Just go ahead and say it out loud. I need God. I need God. That's how we make our battle the Lord. That's the first part. God resists the proud. 
It, we, we, we lift up the Lord. We declare who he is. I love these songs that Paul and Evelyn chose today. They're all about lifting up the Lord. That's how we do it. We declare how great our God is. We declare how awesome he is. We declare that, you know what? This battle might seem big, but God's bigger. And so we exalt the Lord. Number two, we, 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 we transfer, oh, first of all, I gotta say, we transfer our battle from being our battle to being the Lord's battle through the vehicle of prayer. So let's go on to the next part. In the prayer, Jehoshaphat says these words, verse 12, for we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. In other words, he's saying, God, I have no power. How many felt that in 2020? How many times did the goalposts get moved about 14 days to whatever the curb, a curb the whatever? See, it's all jumbled up right now. We felt powerless but when we go to the Lord and say, God, I don't know what to do. God, this, this battle is bigger. This battle is bigger. Uh, we have no power uh, against this vast army, for we are powerless. In other words, we can't do it. I have zero power. That almost sounds like a negative declaration, doesn't it? But that negative declaration of humility and dependence on the Lord actually brings about the powerful, positive change. You see, if 80% is Bill Goodwin trying to fix the problem, that's what guys do, we try to fix the problem, <laughs> then God only has 20% and he's like, you know what? Have at it. Have at it. Good luck, yeah. Yeah. But when we say, I can't handle this, I don't know what I need. First of all, friends, it's so liberating. Friends, this is real talk. I'm, I'm giving you real talk here with the Lord. You go to the Lord and you say, you know what, God, your strength is made perfect in my weakness. But when we're, but when we're prideful and say, you know what, I can handle it. I got it. And the Lord says, well, then you just go right ahead. You just go right ahead. So we see that, that there is this secret, it's prayer, and through prayer we declare that we have no power. We, we, don't, we, we don't have power. And then third, we can declare we don't know what to do. How many times have I felt, God, I do not know what to do. You know, that's one of the challenges of life. It's one of the challenges as a leader. People are wanting to know, Pastor Bill, what do you think we should do? And so often I come back to the Lord and I say, Lord, I don't know what to do. Verse 12, for we are powerless against this great horde coming against us. We do not know what to do. Your mind is frantically racing with ideas. You're, you're thinking of, you know, how can I figure this out? The bills are this high. The money is this high. God, what, I don't know what to do. That's a, that's a piece of the secret of giving your battle over to the Lord. And we see number, let's review here quick. Jehoshaphat prayed. Jehoshaphat declared, uh, we have no power to face the enemy. Jehoshaphat clearly stated to the Lord, we don't know what to do. And then fourth, Jehoshaphat, declares to the Lord, though, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you, Lord. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. When we honor his greatness, when we, when we recount his faithfulness in the past, and we declare our expectancy, God, is on you. It's on you. You, God, we, we, we don't know what to do, but we trust you. In other words, we're saying, God, I trust you that you will make a way, that you, that you will show me what to do, that you will tell me what not to do, and Lord, guide me into what to do, because I don't know what to do. We, we, we get to go low through prayer, through humility, and we get to tell the Lord, to, go ahead, tell him like it is, because you know what? That's when the Lord takes care of business. Oh, the Lord cannot resist that when his children come before him and say, oh God, I got a problem. Maybe it's even, Lord, I got myself in a mess. But God, I don't know what to do. 
God, I don't know how to handle the situation, whatever the battle is, and, we, and we, we're releasing it over to the Lord. And we're saying, but God, although I don't know what to do, my eyes are on you, and the Lord, like he just swoops right in, and he says, all right, you've surrendered it. You've given it to me. You aren't trying to control it or figure it all out or make it work in your own strength. We've surrendered it over to him. And the Lord can swoop in then and say, I, I can't resist this. I will take over your business. Because now the battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. Amen? Amen. I want a testimony to come and share with you. And I want to invite my mother-in-law, Lois, to come and, uh, and share what the Lord has done in her life as a way of a testimony here today. And such a beautiful thing. Hey, Mom. Let me turn this on. Wonderful. There we go. Happy New Year, everyone. Well, Bill, the message is already so, so good. Second Chronicles chapter 20 is one of my favorites. In my Bible, it's underlined, highlighted, circled, many notes. It's so good. Well, the battle belongs to the Lord, and that is so true. Um, many of you know, have heard part of this testimony, and I've shortened it up a little bit for time and everything, but um, Dean and I were, have been married coming up on 59 years. <laughs> and, um, but there was a time in our life that wasn't very good. And um, there was a time when Dean and I were separated uh, because of alcohol and unfaithfulness. And um, like Bill has been saying, I tried to do everything I thought would make everything right. But nothing ever worked out. We had been separated for about three years, and one day I just realized nothing has changed. We were the same that day as we were three years ago. And was it ever going to change? I was doing my best and trying many, many things, but it wasn't working out. It was during this separation that I turned to the Lord. And I had given my heart to the Lord when I was 20, but I was never discipled. And I didn't grow up in a Christian home, so I really knew very, very little about God. But it was during this time that I came to know him. And so I praised God for that time in our life, for that struggle in our life. Um, I started attending Al-Anon meetings, and I bought a devotional there. And it was in that devotional that God spoke to me and let me know that he loved me and that he wanted me to reach out to him. Each time I called out to him, he was there for me. He never failed me, and he helped me through those years. And one morning, I didn't know anything about unction from the Lord or the Lord speaking in a small, quiet voice, but there was just something in me that I needed to write a letter to Dean. And so after I put all my thoughts in that letter, and I ended the letter with saying to Dean that I had decided to put God first in my life, and if we were ever going to be together again, he would have to do the same. I said, only God can change your life. And I want to say that I only knew God as God. I didn't know him as God the Father. I couldn't even say the name Jesus. And I knew nothing about the Holy Spirit. So then I felt the Lord was directing me. I was being directed to not mail the letter, but to call Dean and read the letter to him. A couple of days later, I did call him. I read the letter to him. And when I finished, Dean's comment was that I was using God as a crutch and that I should go ahead and get the divorce. We were already seeking out lawyers for a divorce. And that was the end of our conversation. I got down on my knees beside my bed, and I cried out to God, and I said, I am through. God, you can have him. 
I remembered the story of Lot when God said to Lot and his wife, Leave the city and do not look back. So I said, Please take God out of my or Dean out of my life and help me not to look back at anything that could happen to him. I had thoughts of many things that could happen to him. He could remarry. He could live with another woman. He could be in a car accident. He was always driving while drunk. And he could kill somebody or be killed himself. Or he could end up in jail. And I didn't want to look back and say, oh, I should have stayed with him. So I said, God, just help me not to look back. I totally surrendered Dean to the Lord that night. Totally surrendered him to Dean, to to the Lord. I had given him to God many times before, and in Al-Anon, there's a slogan, let go and let God. Let go of that situation and let God take over, which I did many times, but very instantly I would take it back. So often, we give a situation, our loved one, to the Lord. But the moment that we start thinking once again about what could be done, we've already taken it out of God's hands. So I would hand him over, but then I'd grab him right back because I always had a thought, a new way of doing something. So um, let's see, I'm going ahead. When I surrendered Dean that night, I left him with God. And God did help me to not look back. God had, I didn't know this, but God had a plan for Dean's life, and he had a plan for my life, and he had a plan for our marriage, which I thought I was giving up. Um, God went... That night, that very night on my knees, God started to work on me first. He actually did a deliverance on me in my bedroom, and I had no idea what a deliverance was. He pulled a big root out of me. I don't know how long it had been there. I didn't, don't even know what it was, but I don't care. All I care about is he pulled it out, and I felt the physical pulling of that root out of me, and it was painful, hurt a lot, I cried a lot, but I felt it come out of my mouth, and it was over. And then peace came upon me that I had never known before, and joy, joy, unspeakable joy. Hallelujah. And it was um, from that time on, God really took over my life. I had finally surrendered all to him. This time, I'd finally let go and let God. I finally got the definition of that right. With the surrender, I felt a peace that I'd never known. The Lord was faithful, and he helped me to not look back. With me taking my hands off Dean, God was able then to start working in Dean's life. While I had my hands and fingers in Dean's life, God couldn't do anything. Just like what Pastor Bill said, whatever part we're in it, God has to step back. But this time I'd given Dean over, and Dean's life started to crumble. The Lord was doing a shaking in Dean's life. I don't think Dean saw it coming. The battle belongs to the Lord. Seven weeks after I surrendered Dean, Dean checked into a treatment center. The first night he got down there, he got down on his knees, and he asked Jesus to come into his life. And he was instantly delivered from alcohol and everything associated with it. Praise the Lord. That battle belonged to the Lord. It's good to surrender all to the Lord. Allow him to change your heart, 
believe he will change the heart of your loved ones. We are not able to change anyone's heart. Only the Lord is able to change a heart. Let the Lord do what only he can do. The battle belongs to the Lord. Surrendering your loved one is very difficult. It's very difficult, and you're not quite sure how faithful God will be. But I want you to know he's always faithful. He always comes through. But it is giving your loved one over to the Lord is the best thing you can do for them and for yourself. Remember, God knows them better than you do. And he loves them better than you do. The Lord is so very faithful and true. You can trust him to do what's best. And you know, you don't even have to tell him your ideas of what he should do. His ideas are better. I think there's scripture about that. So that's, there's been about uh, 30 and a half years ago. And it was the best decision I've ever made. Surrender. Don't be afraid of it. It will change your life forever. Surrender will make you stronger. And I had this morning's worship, just like Pastor Bill said, was so amazing. The songs were so amazing that I've written down a few extra little things here, and it's kind of messed up because I was writing on my knee. Um, when we were singing the words to the song, a raise a hallelujah, the words in that song are words we can just pray. Pray out loud. It's a battle song. So uh, it's a prayer about surrender and victory. Surrender is victory. When we surrender... It's victory for us. I am totally dependent on the Lord. I pray about small things as well as the bigger things. And he is faithful to take care of everything. I do want to talk about a little testimony, but um, I, want, I wrote this down too. And... Um, Evelyn, I want you to know, what, when you were standing there and saying, I can't even remember the words now, the one of the song, battle song, and you were like this, I closed, my, I closed my eyes, and you were all in white. You were Jesus. I saw Jesus in you that whole time. Then I opened my eyes, and then you started talking, like Pastor Bill had mentioned, and I closed my eyes during that, and you, Jesus was speaking through you again. I saw you as Jesus. It was beautiful. And a little bit later, I looked at the whole worship team, and everybody was white like Jesus. We're blessed to have a spirit-filled worship team. Um, I just want to say that, and this just came to me this morning, but... So when I married Dean, I started going to church with him. And so it was the first time in my life to go to church every Sunday. And in the church, we were quite young. And in this church, there was a, an, an elderly lady. Her name was Mrs. Cook. And she trusted the Lord. She knew the faithfulness of the Lord. And granted, I knew nothing. But Mrs. Cook, one day at church, the pastor said, Does anybody have a testimony they'd like to come up and give? to the body. And so the elderly lady, Mrs. Cook, she walked all the way up front and she said, I just want to give the Lord the praise because this morning when I was getting dressed, I started getting a run in my nylon. <laughs> and now I know some of the younger people don't even know what a run in a nylon is, <laughs> but back in the day it was devastating. <laughs> But she said, she said, Lord, stop this run. And he did. <laughs> and we, Dean and I, and some of our younger friends at the church, we used to laugh about Mrs. Cook. 
And here I stand. I'm turned into Mrs. Cook. Because <laughs> I pray about every little thing. <laughs> and so that's good. But I want to end with, I also talked about deliverance. And I want to say, don't be afraid of deliverance either. Don't be afraid. It's a good thing. I am so glad I've been free of that root for all these years. Do not be afraid of deliverance. Let the Lord take everything out. Remember, the battle belongs to the Lord. And as George said, Jesus changes everything. Amen. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. I knew we needed to hear that today. Oh, I want to be honoring of time, but obedient to the Lord. And um, Paul, you can come. The beautiful testimony. I just love. My in-laws, Dean and Lois. How many just are grateful for this beautiful couple? God has done. Amen. Amen. Forgive me, you've, some of you have heard this story too. I'm going to give you a short version because what Lois said, I don't want to take away any of that. But I want to give one other testimony of the battle belongs to the Lord. And... Um, When we moved to Arizona to serve at a mega church there, and I knew going on the staff to do youth ministry that my salary would be paid, but I needed to raise all of the money to run the ministry. Well, how do you do that? I was 28 years old. I didn't know how to raise money. And, um, but I did know that in previous ministry, I could do what I called momentum building events. I do events with a large number of students that charge the students a small amount or charge the students an amount that was more than what the event was and I could earn money for the youth ministry budget that way. And so that was my plan going into it. But we move our family across the country and just a short time after getting settled in, I had a, a meeting with the CFO of the church. And he shared with me that the ministry is $33,000 in the red. And so just to let me know, I need to raise $33,000 before I'm at zero. And I was devastated. Matter of fact, I felt sick to my stomach. And I got done with this meeting with him where I held it all together. And Okay, yeah, yeah. That's... But I left and I literally went to the parking lot. I got in my car and I drove home. Because like Jehoshaphat, I did not know what to do. And I knew that there was some excitement and some expectations that somehow God would use this 20-something to take this youth ministry to another level. But I went home and Carla was there and we literally, after I told her about it, we literally got on our knees. I remember it so clearly. We got on our knees and we cried, literally cried. God, you brought us here. Why couldn't the church have told us this before we came? Well, maybe we would have let that be part of our factor of deciding. I don't know. But we gave it over to the Lord. I didn't, I didn't know this principle then. But as I look back, just as Lois looks back, you see moments where you, where you follow the secret of giving your battle to the Lord. And so we knelt there. We held hands. We cried. And we said, Lord, you brought us here. And I don't think I said the words, but in essence, Lord, we don't know what to do. And we ask, Lord, that you would make a way so that we could reach as many students, that we could reach the masses of 25,000 teenagers in a five-mile radius of that church. And I did not know how God would answer that prayer. But a short time later, a week, ten days later, the lead pastor of the church and I had an appointment to have lunch with a couple, a couple of seven children, three of which were in the student ministry at that time. And as we were sitting over lunch, longer story, 
I started to put some pieces together that, okay, now I know who your children are, your boys are. And didn't your older son pick them up on Wednesday in a Hummer? We'll put the picture up. In a Hummer? And Rob says, yeah, yeah, that was my Christmas gift. He's like, I've always wanted a Hummer. And, 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 and so my wife bought it for me for Christmas. And it's just an extra vehicle. Bill, you can take it anytime you want. Come take some youth out for ice cream or whatever. I'm like, I'm going to do that. <laughs> and they asked at that lunch if I needed some money to get started. And I was thinking, yeah, I need $33,000. But I didn't say that. I just said, you know, whatever the Lord puts on your heart. Well, they handed me a check for $10,000. And I was like, oh, thank you, God. I need $23,000 to be at zero. (laughs) And we had a wonderful time getting to know them. The very next day, I was going out to breakfast with Carla, and we stopped at my office. I don't know why. And the light was blinking on my phone, which I was new. That never happened. I had a message, and I listened to the message. It was now my new friend, and he said, hey, give me a call as soon as you get this. And so I call him, and he says, hey, last night after dinner, we were talking to the, the kids about what a great time we had at lunch with you. And, and, and anyway, after dinner, I was sitting in, while Lisa was finishing up the dishes, and the Lord just spoke to my heart, give Bill the Hummer. And he said, well, that's kind of interesting. I just got it. <laughs> so I walk, he said, I walked in the kitchen, and I said to my wife, I think God just told me to give Bill the Hummer. And she's wiping the counter and she said, the Lord just told me the same thing. Why don't you call him tomorrow and give him the Hummer? He says, Bill, I want you to know we paid $110,000 cash for that Hummer. And I want to give it to you and the ministry. The battle belongs to the Lord. The battle belongs to the Lord. And so uh, I got the title and the keys to a $110,000 Hummer with under 2,000 miles on it. It wasn't for me personally. It was for the ministry. But I sure drove it a while while I figured that out. (laughs) And then... We traded that Hummer in. And I got two brand new vans to take students to California and all over to do ministry. And a refund check of $63,000. And when I gave that to the CFO, we rejoiced together. He wasn't against me, he was for me. He just says, surely God is with you. Surely God is with you. And he says, you know what, since our meeting, I talked to the other executive team, and you know what, the previous person in your position, that's just on paper. The church paid all those bills. And I talked to the executive team, and we're going to erase the $33,000. you are now starting with the $63,000 in your youth ministry account. And I said, no, 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 I already got ten, so I'm at seventy-three. The battle, friends, belongs to the Lord. Come on, stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. I hope you'll be with us every week of this series. I believe this series can change your life and how we learn to give our battles over to the Lord. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for Dean and Lois's testimony. I thank you for even when she didn't know exactly how to do it. Lord, you swooped in. We thank you that not only you moved in their lives, both of their lives back then, but we thank you for the blessing that they are for us now. Father, we thank you for your provision for that ministry as a testimony. I give that to you, Lord, as a you get all the credit for that, Lord. Father, today, as we start this new year, this new series, Lord, I believe there's some in our midst, maybe in person or online, that are in the midst of a struggle. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a relationship that's tattered. God, maybe it's some 
type of financial hardship. God, whatever it is that those are facing right now, God, we ask that you'll help us to surrender it truly and not pick it back up, but to give it over to you so that, Lord God, truly the battle belongs to you. And Lord, in the days and months to come, when we face difficulties, Lord, may we not take it on ourselves. But may we take this secret, this principle of your word, and apply it to our lives, to our circumstances and our situations. And then, Lord, we can give testimony and glory to you for how you once again come through unexpectedly, lavishly, exceedingly abundantly more than we could ask or think or imagine. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I want to speak a blessing over us. And if you're, if you're able, if you have the time, just we're going to worship this song one more time as we close today. And if you need to slip out during this song, excuse me, if you need to slip out during this song, that's fine too. Nicole will be in the lobby helping to help you purchase these uh, devotionals if you, or journals if you'd like to do that as we close. So receive this blessing. As you go, may our loving Lord go with you. May he go before you to show you the way, behind you to encourage you, above you to watch over and care for you. May he be beside you as your closest friend. And most of all, may he dwell in your hearts. May he fill you with faith, with hope and with love. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, let's just declare the victory belongs to Jesus. Lift your voice.